idea really up front was to sort of set a bit of a strategic frame for uh, you know for the day with a real um, focus on the sort of ABC sector. And as many of you know, engineering consultancy businesses are you know right at the heart of where we're working. And I am very, very uh, grateful, and uh, I think we all should be for the expertise that is mustered to sort of kick this off. Um, I mean, very quickly, and these pithy summaries do not do justice, but um, starting with Terry in the middle. So Terry's a, a very senior uh, director at uh, Arup, um, 28 years. I think well, that's probably updated, actually, Terry, because it's probably uh, your LinkedIn bio. <laughs> probably is an Arup, but... Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, I think, like, uh, we're going to come to Darren in a minute, almost a boy to man in the, in, in, in the rail industry, with a real, real focus on benefits management, which, as we know, is the absolute spine of a well-organised programme project to work. So we had the privilege of working with Terry when we were helping to build maps, the Arab toolbox, but specifically with the benefits kind of component of that. And, and I know, you know, Terry is... Uh, taken that discipline to multiple end clients of, of Arabs over the years, so we'll kind of dive into that. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, Mark is a, a strategy, a senior strategy director at Amy. Um, so where Mark's skill set is really kind of being able to unpack the whole sort of net zero sustainability resilience agenda, but that's kind of essentially Mark's bailiwick at Amy is to make that alive for that organization and how they take that out to their clients and, and, and the industry. Hugely a varied, um, career prior to Amy, which is relatively recent, isn't it? Yeah, 18 um, months. 18 months, which is uh, multiple uh, management consultancy, business consultancy type roles, but I think that, with that subtopic always being a, a key one. And then finally, Darren, and I have to say thank you. Um, uh, so we, um, we had um, uh, Richard from TNT was due to be sat in this seat as about two days ago who was a real digital tech lead at Turner and Townsend, unfortunately went down with COVID. We've had, it's interesting, there's a few COVID uh, pullouts, actually it's kind of whizzing around again. Um, and Darren, at very, very last minute, uh, uh, is a, a, a full transparency, Mark, a very good friend, and has jumped into the seat. But again, like Terry, we're very, very lucky to have him. I mean, Darren's 40 year experience is starting the rail industry, starts, I think, literally with a shovel in his hand, doing rail maintenance, you know, Back in the back in the day with British Rail, and now, uh, as we'll get to here, running some very very complex <coughs> engineering projects of work, uh, one at the moment for the for the Welsh Welsh government. So yeah, we are very very lucky to have you guys. I think firstly, before I get in, a little bit of a thank you, round of applause. <laughs> yeah. So um, and keep me honest to the time. So we have this until. Till 10 days. Oh, wow. So we, that's yeah. good. We've got a good chat. We're ahead of schedule. Uh, <laughs> that's good. We got, and, and I think it'll be great to make as much use of this as possible because we, we're going to go out before we're going to come in. And this sort of sets some really, I think, interesting frames for the day. So I spoke to the guys uh, you know, about this briefly before. They're all very, very busy, so it's quite uh, snatch conversations. But essentially to put some kind of frame on this. And we felt there was four topics that you know if you take a strategic frame are worth going into um, and they're going to be the sort of economic reality just what's going on you know UK economy and the world uh, we're then going to dive into the sort of net zero sustainability challenge specifically we're then going to dive into the whole topic of people spe specifically as it pertains to the sort of AEC sector and some of the sort of um, people related challenges there um, I'll unpack it when we get to it. And then finally, sort of all things digital, innovation, AI. So four, broadly four blocks to keep us sort of uh, uh, time organised. Um, my job is effectively to be the sort of lay Terry Wogan. You know, I'm not the AEC, but to make, do my best to uh, draw out what is uh, genuine deep industry expertise on my shoulder. So I think um, I'll, I'll kick off the sort of economic bit. Um, you know, sort of things that are whizzing around in my mind is the, the the fundamental performance data that's coming out from the UK, both economically, also in relation to sort of P3M. You know, the kind of at best it feels mixed, and actually some of the data suggests that uh, you know projects and programs are still not being delivered to the you know efficiency they should be. You know, we still have these massive mega project cost overruns, schedule slips, but just economically as well. You know, UK productivity data 
particularly in this sector, is definitely lagging its kind of global counterparts. Uh, we've got the whole UK levelling up agenda, which is obviously uh, you know, very, very uh, key to this government, and I'm sure uh, that the next, whoever they're going to be, um, you know, how do you genuinely sort of level up economic opportunity across the, the regions of the UK? Um, we've also got the sort of post-Brexit disruption to supply chain, cost, inflation. You know, it's just tougher to uh, cost schedule at the very least, and it doesn't look like that's getting any better. And you know, some of the frankly terrifying stuff that's going on in the world that could that could, that, that could potentially get worse. So, some pretty meaty kind of. Uh, uh, background feeds. And my opening question then is just going to be in, in relation to that performance data point, i.e., UK lagging productivity, particularly in this sector, P3M, you know, do you guys accept that that is the case, firstly? If so, why? And, you know, do you have optimism that it's, that it's kind of improving? And I don't know if anyone wants to jump in first or I force the, force the order. Look, perhaps I could, uh, I guess thinking about that question, there's a lot, there's a lot in there, and I think probably at the, at the very top is our society's relationship with infrastructure. I don't know that we have a very good, a healthy relationship with it. And we worry about investing 100 billion in a, in a, in a major infrastructure program that's going to uh, last for 50, possibly 100 years. And we're spending 150 billion every year on pensions. I mean, we don't worry about pensions, so we're always quite stressed about investments. Uh, and you know, when we're nervous about uh, how much things cost, and you know, you know, I don't. I think it doesn't drive the right behaviours in people who are specifying major programs of work. Uh, and I've seen this before, where uh, from a benefits uh, management perspective, um, I've noticed something odd with the project, and said to the sponsor, oh, "I'm not sure this is going to work like this because." And he says, we do realise too that if we'd asked for the whole amount we needed, we'd never get approval. So it's like, oh, hang on. So there are kind of odd behaviours that go on. Uh, we're, so it's, we're starting off on the wrong foot in many cases. If we had more honesty uh, about uh, and acceptance of the, the cost and the value of these infrastructure projects, which uh, at the end of the day, um, they are the things in the society that empower every individual to do things that they want to do. The fact that I could get here from my home was driven by you know, the infrastructure that was, has been provided. And I don't think we generally value that enough. And if we could start on that kind of you know, position, we would... Um, and, uh, thank you, sorry. And I'm definitely going to bounce to Darren because it's exactly what you we, we chat about in the coffee. <laughs> just yeah, minute, so. certainly, Dom. I think from my perspective, obviously, like, as Dom said, I, I started in British Rail in the 1980s and um, I've seen product productivity dives steadily since then. And there, there's two reasons for that primarily. <clears throat> One is... Um, the rail industry suddenly became terrified of killing anybody. Um, so what they decided to do was separate people from trains. So when I started, we would walk out and work on the railway with trains whittling by, and we'd have an old guy about 60 looking out, waiting for a train. This is all true. And we'd have a whistle, and we'd say, Woo! There's one coming, lads! <laughs> and we'd literally scarper out of the way. But we'd work all day. We work all day in the daylight. If I dropped something, I'd find, oh, there it is. I'd pick it up, you know. Yeah. And then... <coughs> Overnight, we decided to, to, to separate people from trains, and that meant all work was done at night. And so, in order to get the same productivity, you need to automate what you're doing. You know? But actually, you need to factor in how difficult it is to work at night. And neither of those things happened. So basically, everything slowed down, and we did less with more resources. Yeah. And we ended up making people ill, because working at night permanently is not good for you. It's been an absolute disaster if I'm honest. Yeah. And so in terms of actual physical productivity, we haven't found a way of breaking out of that, breaking out of that cycle. And the second thing was, um, I've often said this, that if I could reincarnate, I go into a graveyard and bring out a track worker from, from 1870, that person could quite, I could, I could say, oh, you know, hello, amazing you're alive again, let's go to work. <laughs> and that person could work quite happily because nothing has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed. You know, I think, the actual building blocks, the components of rail engineering are exactly the same as they were then. What industry could you say, say that? You know, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no industry. You yeah. imagine a, a Ford mechanic looking at a Tesla, thinking, yeah. oh goodness, what the hell is this? You know, no, we've, we've really, we've not evolved um, um, in componentry because there hasn't been the competition or the, 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 the environment. Competitive person. Yeah, yeah, and the, the third thing is the bespoke plant. You know, we have a lot of our, the rail industry has very specialist tools and equipment. 
And in order to deregulate that, what we basically said was these big special machines that lift panels of track up, they're so expensive, they cost millions of pounds. If we're going to get competition in the market, we, no one's going to buy those. So we're going to do everything with diggers, you know, little diggers. Everyone's got little diggers. And we did that and, and actually slowed everything down. So I think for us, we definitely, we are less productive than when I started, which is a great shame to say. Yeah, so there are there are very complicated reasons behind that, and I think there's some, that's a very simple explanation. That's, that's really, I told you it's going to be grounded in. So, <laughs> um, Mark, any build on? Yeah, well, a couple of things on front with Terry's, and I think that, that just that long term view that we we can all see doesn't happen, um, and I think we all struggle with how can we how we can influence that. So I, was, I was read an article just recently about the the wind farm and connections, and and someone was saying that some of the um, the grid connecting companies are putting orders in seven years in advance. So that's how far that industry is mm. thinking. And I'm not sure in the rail industry we're, we're, we're thinking like that. And yeah. it's, a, it's a great shame because we, we just need to lay some significant long-term bets. Totally. Um, and uh, yeah. Thank you. And that's um, it's probably a pertinent point to mention it. And there, there's a body called uh, the National Infrastructure Commission that like was set up about a decade ago, I think. Um, if people are aware of it, but its job is to, it's an it's a executive agency of the uh, Treasury, it's, its job is to essentially keep government honest to some of these points that you know, have been very well made. It, it publishes its national infrastructure assessment every five years, essentially every parliament, with a sort of 20, 30 year horizon to keep governments, we're doing clearly five year terms, honest to questions that are you know, longer than a five year term. It published its second ever assessment uh, yesterday. Uh, so I've got my iPad here. I was having a brief, brief scan of it last night, this morning. It's you know, it's a, it's a it's a bit of a tome of a document. But um, if you see me with my iPad, and I'm trying to catch up with what it's recommending. But one of the recommendations is there's got to be a breakthrough that allows governments to set agendas that are far far longer than the five year term. And and actually, is to get to some of the net zero challenges that investment in. Uh, infrastructure that Terry points to has got to rise from where it, where it is now. Ultimately, to see benefits coming down the line, but it has to has to rise. Um, so, 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 I, I think the other thing, just from from, I'm sure you're all experienced it, but it, the, the environment in which we all work is more complicated. So there's more things that we have to take into account, mm -hmm. and I think we're all at a, at a human level. Mm -hmm. That's quite hard to navigate through, mm -hmm. um, and quite often the response as a human is you just go into a silo because like, like you can't deal with is it safety, is it specification, is it the economic, so you then have to almost channel it down and I haven't got a solution to that but I think that's part of the productivity yeah. sort of mix that's it's confusing for people. Listen, there'll be an interest, uh, when we get to the network rail uh, case study later, you know, it's, they call their methodology PACE uh, for, the, for, you know, for a deliberate reason. It's, you know, they, they're having a huge amount of pressure, DFT down, to uh, provide a slight pared down methodology that allows decision making to be faster. You know, um, so let's, we should hold the interrogation as to whether it's actually been successful in doing that. And Doug, you, you might have some perspectives when you see it. Um, just on this point, though, of um, that, that also to sort of solve some of the productivity challenge, it almost invariably goes to collaboration, has to be in place across the industry um, just keen to get your views on just does the you know because collaboration then abuts with profit maximization for a lot of organizations mm -hmm. and so it's a you know easily espoused kind of ambition but you know every private you know company is seeking to, to you know to make profit gain just from your own company experiences collaboration are you seeing more of it you know to what degree it needs to kind of kind of be raised even more up the agenda? I think I've worked on just about, every, since we got privatised into 1994-96, we went through that process, I think I've worked on every form of contract possible known to man in that time. And without doubt, I think the most successful have been ones where they have enforced collaboration as part of the terms and conditions of the contract. So we sit in shared offices, we, we sit together, and there is a some sort of metric that understands that process and, and feeds back. I think those old school contracts and what I call an old school contract is you know I, I, I'm a naive-ish client but I know I want to build a railway station and you know I've had a very very early study like a, a, you know, a grip one two study to use the old term or sort of a, a proposal and it's going to be in the order of 10 million pounds 
know, the tendency is then to go and knock that together into a into a some sort of specification, go out to tender, get seven prices back, choose the lowest price, whatever anybody says, you know, go into contract yeah. and then you know it unfolds gradually in the same mess that it always unfolds, you know. This is if we, if we are ahead of schedule. This is the only rail project that's ever been ahead of schedule. This meeting here, you know, because I think we, we, suffer, we suffer the same. We, we we make the same mistakes every time. And I think when I worked in um, I worked in a joint venture with the French Railways. So Colas is a is a French company. Amy Colas we had a JV, and we worked with um, Never Rail, who were the client. All sat in the same office. We had open book accounting, and we collaborated. And it was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's going to be the contract that leads the way. I think natural collaboration, organic collaboration in a competitive world is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you. I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, we have an ethos in our that we talk we talk about um, total engineering, and what we mean by that is that um, we get the architect and the engineers and the users all involved in the design and development process from day one. And unless you can get that, um, you know, that intense level of collaboration and cooperation, it's really difficult to do a successful project. Um, we, we are, I mean, like a number of companies, ISO 40001 um, certified for, you know, for collab collaboration management. And we try and bring those um, skills into, into projects that we work on. Um, but generally, yeah, I mean, it, it, as you said, it's, it's procurement, which is the weak point in that whole process, because um, I don't think they're quite get it yet. No, uh, and, because, and the complex um, programs of work involving many parties, uh, they think, okay, we'll set these contracts up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight contracts to do all the work, uh, and, and but there's no there's no, uh, no accommodation made for the scope gaps in contracts. So they're trying to fix a problem, but it's not in that contract, not in that, con not in that so how can we fix it? And there's no risk pot to actually Mm -hmm. Recognise that it, like it's new to the scope, we need to like scope it out and get it done, yeah. and just try and squeeze everybody who's involved until that all collapses. So, yeah. And I imagine with your benefits management yeah. sort of hat, you're right at the centre of some of those conversations. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We're, we're yeah. having at the moment exactly the project I'm working on in Wales, but you know, if any of you follows the rail industry, there's a huge big transformation project in Wales where we've, we've got, we're buying, we've bought 36 basically tram trains. And we're going to run them all from Cardiff up to the Valley Heads, Merthyr, Aberdeer, Treherbe, and we're part of the transformation team. You know, we're working in that. And I'm at, one of my projects is the Taswell Depot, so it's the big maintenance depot to look after those trains. So it's 110 million pounds worth of work. We've got f three or four primary contractors, and exactly that. You know, we've got scope gaps. We've got a few. You know, inevitably issues in a big integrated program like that that come out and there's no contractual mechanism for dealing with them you know nothing even you know if my cabins are, are where you want to put your cabins you know and, I, and you're saying you know, i need to start this work here but i need to move my cabins and i say well my cabins are there you know, you know the contractors are arguing with each other and there's no framework so i do think that I go back to what i said about repeating myself again you know Clients need to design that out through. So that gets to the number of this is the building the intelligent client. And, Absolutely, and, and, and yeah, ed yeah. Educating an intelligent yeah. client. I and guess. looking at data, looking at data, you know, if the last 10 rail projects have overrun by 40% on time and 60% in cost, then that's happened for a reason. Yeah. You know, it doesn't mean to say that everyone's an idiot out there and doesn't know what they're doing. That's generally not the case. Yeah. It, it, you've got a load of experts you know, yeah. on, on the tools that you know they're fantastic, they're the best welders, the best yeah. it's, it's actually the framework, the, 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 the inflexibility and the rigidity of those contracting structures which <coughs> I believe they needed to get the best price uh, sure. then backfire. So any I guess that coming to mind, any thoughts on if the number of it is the intelligent client and genuinely, you know, as as kind of expert advisory, you know, suppliers in the industry helping to educate <laughs> Intelligent clients. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Well, well there's, there's something that the competitive um, monopolies of or is it the CMA have just issued just recently, in the past week or something, that's worth looking at. And they, what they've done is they've recognised that in the in the sort of I'm able to come onto it, the net zero sustainability field, that the only way of achieving what what we need to do is through collaboration with with suppliers and partners. And actually, they're looking at it, so so actually, you will be able to procure in a different way, so long as that doesn't sort of curtail 
quality and price, but actually we, th there is a mechanism for doing that. And if that can be rolled out more broadly, I think that'd be quite helpful. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to move to the final bit of, before we move to the sort of next categories around this sort of, you know, the, the cost, you know, Brexit supply chains are this, let's just say strained at best. Um, you know, we had the World Trade Organization recently put a warning out that commodity pricing is due potentially to go up again. You know, it's probably the, the, the move away from sort of global collaboration is obviously fueling some of that. Um, as I said, you know, stuff that's going on in the world is, is not, uh, is not is, you know, scary and not helping. Um, but we've got this UK infrastructure that's needing massive overhaul. Um, you know, how, how do we... How do those two things, you know, come together? How do we how do we mend a very dilapidated UK infrastructure? So my company walked away from running all the trains in Wales. You know, we have, we won an eight billion pounds contract to be the operator in Wales, um, and after COVID, nobody got onto the train. You know, surprise, surprise! No money came into the fare box. Surprise, surprise! All those investment promises that we'd made for the extra money we were going to make with it by increasing revenues all went out the window overnight. And so there was a quantum shock and I think what has occurred now, as I said to Mark earlier on, I believe it's a permanent change. I don't believe we'll ever go back to commuting the way we did. I don't believe that people want it. I don't believe that people need to. And I think that in transport infrastructure, certainly rail infrastructure, those investment funding models of the past where you could say I'm going to get so much into fare box and it's going to be great because we were on a huge passion for growth before COVID. You know, you couldn't get on a train, it was rammed, you know. Mm. And, and now it's a very different story. And I think it's flatlined a little bit, and so all those investment model, models are broken. So we've got to look at a lower cost rail infrastructure. The old models don't work anymore. You know, my old trackman from the 1830s making 285 kilo concrete sleepers, that's just not going to work anymore. So we need to look at light rail, we need to look at a different way of doing it. Well, I, I think actually it's the it's the it's the permanent, design innovation. Template. Yeah, design innovation to compensate for that permanent change, which I believe is a permanent change in, in travelling behaviour. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Sorry, Mark, you for the Yeah, I think the, the, you know, the cost pressures. Uh, you know, um, uh, the cost of goods. I think of that. I mean, one way to think about it is through the sustainability lens, uh, and the two angles of that. One is um, you know design things for whole life. So understand what the cost is to maintain and operate, not just what it costs to build. Mark, did you, do you want to yeah, add just one other final point, which was just um, uh, this this idea of being clear about where to put the the money to repair things as well. So to you know, good use of data. So we, we're doing some work up in Scotland looking at um, sort of vulnerable assets. So actually, rather than sort of upgrading. You know the whole piece of infrastructure. You sort of target it, and that's another way of sort of managing costs. Got it. In that type of environment. I think, and this is the perfect segue. So thank you guys for moving to the sort of net zero sustainability point. And you know, at a, at a high level, um, <coughs> you know, there are uh, win wins here. If, if we get some of this right, there is sort of an economic you know benefit down the line. You have to clearly hold your nerve. But so all things net zero sustainability. I think you know, I just. Set the frame. We've got you know everything around the sort of decarbonisation um, imperative. You know sustainability practices. You know fundamentally, industry has got to rapidly de uh, uh, you know lower emissions. We've got to embed sustainability in, 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 in all that we do. We've got the UK net zero 2050. I think it's the was the carbon budget in 2035, isn't it? The sixth, I think. Um, yeah, and just to mention that sort of uh, the, the assessment that dropped yesterday, last night. So it is clearly, as you would imagine, really emphasising a couple of these uh, aspects. Um, talking about the fact that the electricity system has to decarbonise very, very quickly. Um, decarbonise how we, you know, have heat, building heat. Um, uh, you know, that is a major change to how homes are um, going to be... Uh, you know, heat engineered going forward and it's recommended actually quite punchy um, government subsistence that will be required for that to, to be facilitated um, and even uh, again it very strongly comes out of this assessment that hydrogen carbon capture storage almost like new asset classes that we need to work out how to how to build this stuff mm -hmm. so there's a whole lot going on here i'm going to start with mark because this is right at the heart of what mark does but i guess to ask um yeah i know you know if we read the arab amy websites and strategies you know this is right at the 
centre of your uh, you know your com company sort of strategy vision. But what what does that sort of actually mean in a day to day basis? You know, you know, guys, over your course of your careers, what have you seen change? I guess. And but what does it what does it really mean for your organisations now? Um, what are you investing in in this whole area? You know, do you do you have optimism for where this is all heading? I guess as well. But Mark, so I, I to pick up on the point of Terry, just this whole life costing is an important part of the whole mix, and. Um, so we're, we're, that's definitely a direction of travel for us. I think there's an inherent tension with clients, so it comes back to the, to the money thing, and there's definitely been a shift in the, in the sort of, A, the political narrative, and actually that, that is flushing through with the, what we're seeing from, from clients. Um, but in terms of what we're, we're, we're investing in, we're, we're absolutely committed to it, and also it picks up on the, on the um, collaboration piece around how you build these things at scale. So we're looking at a piece around the electrification of the railway and how we're using batteries on, on the trains to load balance the grid. And so that's just one tiny example, but actually we need to be looking at that you know, across the nation. So you know, in a very simplistic way, you, you know, humans can play a big role in that so that you know, we need to be drinking gin at five o'clock, not putting the kettle on. Type of thing to stop. Happy days. Uh, <laughs> this all I, want, I want to stand up hope. Another drink to our Great. Terry. Yeah, so I think um, the whole uh, sustainability is everything strap line that we have in our strategy. I mean, that's been building probably for the last eight years or so, and it is changing the way we approach uh, business on a day to day basis. I mean, we, we, we no longer do work for um, some of our fossil fuel companies. Um, because you know, we uh, want to be more in the sort of hydrogen space. Um, we, we look at every project, every new project, we assess it in terms of how it aligns with the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, so we, we take a sort of proactive think about what is the right project for us to be doing. Um, and then, uh, you know, the people that, we, that, that come to the business um, from, the, from the grads and, and, and new starters, uh, they all want to work on sustainability. Can I, you know, what's the project I'm working on? I can get on in sustainability, I want to do a like circular economy, and they're all coming with that passion to, to do that type of work. Uh, and the firm's entirely open to that, and we're doing more and more projects on the, of that sort, um, yeah, and more modelling in that space as well. So, yeah, we become a business as usual, really. Yeah, it's an interesting, I think the, um, my oldest daughter is a, uh, comes a final year of engineering, uh, design engineering, but yeah, her total motivation is this agenda as well. I think that infusion of new talent is really going to necessarily speak to some of this. Dan? Just interested in what Mark said, actually. So I think, I think the challenge for us mm -hmm. as a business is, is knowing where, 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 what to go at, really. I mean, the truth about the UK railways are is Brunel had built them by 1859. They're built, they're done. Yeah, if you're going to build a railway, there's one rule, build in a straight line. That's the first thing, because if you build in a straight line, it doesn't wear out. Anything else, it wears out. The railway's set, so there's not a lot of point, really, in looking, in my view, in redesigning the rail system. Where the intelligence needs to be working is, is, is looking after what we've got more efficiently. And, and I think that's, that, that's the point that, that, that Mark was making. Um, we haven't made any inroads in... In, in new new sort of track form or, or re well reconstruction really, but what we have I bought or well, we've bought and the Welsh government's bought thirty six of these battery trains and that they are fantastic things and what they do is they save a huge amount of capital cost. So when you're electrifying a railway, which is always better than, than diesel, um, you've got this onboard energy storage system of a huge, which is a, like a big electric battery on the train, and in areas where it would be very costly or politically difficult to put up overhead lines, which are ugly big things, so you know, in listed areas, through wet tunnels, on viaducts, on bridges, on stations. We don't put them up anymore. We can save all of that carbon and capital cost and we just tell the train, when you're coming along, there's a little beacon on the track that speaks to the train that says, put your pantograph down and switch to battery power. And then when it's gone through that section and the wires are back again, so that's, that's been a really good innovation, and the yeah. Welsh Government have championed that, yeah. and we're just doing all the power modelling. Well, I think it's intelligent maintenance uh, and data collection and capture, which are the things. Yeah. These, these trains that we buy now have got so much real-time information on them 
they got cameras. That, you know, we used to have an inspection train that went out that was, you know, cost millions of pounds. You'll see it running around. It's a big yellow thing and it measures all sorts of stuff. Yeah. You know, but we've got service trains running around all day. You know, so why don't we just put a camera on those? You know, I think we're, we're sort of thinking about that sort of thing yeah. now. But actually, I think it's, it's knowing that you could, you could spend a lot of time trying to tell, you know, uh, the people of the United Kingdom that we need to build a brand new straight line between Glasgow and London. But you never get anywhere. You know, I don't think yeah. we would. It's understanding what you can do, and I think w w with us, it's making small changes and understanding where we waste money <coughs> through better intelligence and data management. And as Mark said, you know, not spending time on stuff that doesn't wear out. And just, and just building on that. So that, I mean, all of this again talks to innovation. You know, there's there's new careers, there's new um, technical domains that you know probably we haven't even thought of the ball. Um, which you know feeds back into economic growth as well. So you know, this agenda can mm -hmm. you know have, have, have gains all around. But again, I, I, I was looking at this last night. This you know just one data point I was struck by is to get to the twenty fifty point. Just with uh, respect to electric vehicles, uh, the number of charging points we need to build between now and then. Is, we, we can't do it with linear build out of what you know we're currently able to do it has to be genuinely exponential we have to be able to exponentially grow year on year to now in 2050 how many charging points we're physically able to put in and so I guess I'm curious building on that it's just this speed of delivery speed of innovation just you know give us give us a bit of optimism I guess what what things are you seeing like the rail battery example but you know new technologies new innovations that give us a potential fighting chance of you know, meeting that you know, that kind of agenda uh, well, well, I think actually it's a slightly different point, which is actually about this collaboration point and actually the need for all, all of, you know, there's so, so, such a drive in the industry and actually if we can come together, I think that would actually accelerate a lot of the, a, a lot of the moves rather than necessarily some technical in, in innovation. Mm. Some is actually quite practical. Yeah. Um, and, and, and actually there might be a little bit of, um, you know, there's always this tension <coughs> about, um, engagement with communities okay and, and actually there's a little bit of a sometimes we might need to ignore a little bit of that for the for the greater good yeah um, because sometimes that might be slowing progress up yeah and, that, and I that's think it, a little bit of a painful again another really strong point is you know planning processes are still way too Byzantine for yeah. us getting anywhere near this uh, yeah and, he, and, and there are I mean just on the on the you know, you'll have read all about the sort of connecting to the grid with the, with the wind, with, you know, the renewable systems that are delaying. And um, what, one of the reasons that there, there are so many delays is that um, they connect the grid up in sequence. So it's like in, in order. So if you if you applied first, you you that, that you're next in line to connect to the grid, even if another project has been completed and is ready to go. So there's some weird regulations that, that need changing that would massively accelerate our, our you know, the road to, to net zero. Yeah. yeah, and that's all doable, isn't it? And that's all doable. Yeah. It's yeah. not. That doesn't take. That doesn't take new technology. That doesn't take yeah. you know, super engineer. Yeah. yeah, that's all doable. Yeah, because yeah. I think some of the, some of the technologies are. It'll take so long to scale up. Yeah, it's actually not going to make enough difference. Yeah. Whereas, whereas a lot of it's already already within our gift. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So I think um, thinking about um, green energy. When when sort of wind turbines first started going up around the country, I was thinking. Point is, we're never going to be able to do any substantial amount of energy production using wind turbines. But I was absolutely shocked to hear recently the I can't remember the figures, but how much proportion of our energy overall in the country is actually green energy. Um, so I think uh, that makes me optimistic for the future in terms of um, our ability to you know, embrace new technology and get things in the ground and get it done, even though, you know, notwithstanding the problems we have with infrastructure projects generally. but. Yeah, no, got it. I think, you know, again, this sort of document reminds us that, you know, 50s, we did a large build out on the electrical kind of, you know, national grid, you know, we've kind of largely cracked that in a decade, you know, 60s and 70s, we built, you know, huge chunks of the road network in the country. So, you know, you put your mind to it, you know, there, there are gains to be. Yeah, and I think the, the, the grid infrastructure, uh, to, in order to provide sufficient electricity to every home to charge your electric car, which we'll all be having in the future, say, mm -hmm. so, uh, it's not nowhere near sufficient to take that capacity. But if you think about energy networks in a different way, uh, and about the prosumer, you know, the, the you know the, the the homes that are using the, the 
solar, getting solar panels on their roofs, and um, so and being able to manage that uh, processing that infrastructure in a more clever way through data and control, uh, that will actually reduce um, the demand on the sort of backbone infrastructure, which is really the sort of supply demand yeah. flexibility. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good one. Um, final bit on this, and then we're going to move to the next bit. That just something that Darren, you mentioned per, um, when we were having a coffee, it was the, um, you know, in terms of resilience and sustainability, you know, guidelines are of no use to the industry. There needs to be, and this is really simpatico again with this uh, yeah. NIA, is um, there needs to be government led policy which is, you know, codified what is expected on. Absolutely, on absolutely. I think like, just picking up on Terry's point there, I mean, it. it it could happen, but it might not. It's, it, we're just, we're just, we're hopeful, aren't we? Mm. We're hopeful that people's homes will become more efficient. We're hopeful that the sum, the sum of all the LED light bulbs that we fit, will equal the, you know, yeah. seventy-five million new cars we need to. But we don't know, yeah. Yeah. and it's not managed. It's yeah. totally unmanaged. Yeah. So yeah. it's an organic process that may or may not fall right side. You know, and my own feeling is that you know we'll really struggle with that. But you, you can understand the concept. You know, there could be a natural balance yeah, yeah. Out there where we suddenly start using less energy. You know, however, when you look at climate change and look at some of the other things that are playing into that, you know, we're going to use a lot more energy, sorting ourselves out. So I think that's difficult. I think, and it does need, yeah. you know, it's some kind of meta organisation to find it. Because, you know, it was, like, it was like that fact this year, Greece, Greece had that twelve-hour downpour, which was more rain in twelve hours than it had in a year previously. Mm -hmm. um, so then if you build that kind of resilience, yeah. you know, what's the right balancing act? And somebody's got to exactly. keep firm policy. <laughs> well, Scotland's got a red warning, red weather warning. Yeah. The first one for 61 years today, you know, yes. for rain. Yes. Yeah. And I think the devastation that that's going to cause to a Victorian um, sewer network, yeah. you know, it, it's going to be huge. It's um, and, and I think there's a role for, for designers in this around building, you know, going back to this, we, we, we sort of don't know what the future's going to hold. So therefore, how to deal with that in our design designs, and actually some of that will be around designing flexibility. And what I mean by that is, if you're looking at, say, building a flood defence, how how high do you build that? So do you build it for a, for a hundred year flood or a five hundred year flood, or do you design it so that actually you can you can increase it over time rather than do, do you know what I mean? And, and I think there's some interesting yeah, innovations. Really, so but design the, the merge of those two points is. You know, it has to come from a you know government-led policy. It does. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a big area, but yeah. that's a you know, fascinating kind of, uh, conclusion on that point. But yeah, let's move to the the third block, which is all things, I guess, people and the you know the backdrop to some of this kind of topic would be um, you know there is UK a lot of workforce shortage, particularly in this sort of engineering <laughs> construction sector. You know, quite sort of severe UK skills uh, uh, set shortage. There is a uh, aging workforce, um, uh, inadequate recruitment, and the irony of this next point is not going to loop, uh, be lost on anybody when I make it. Isn't that there is a lack of diversity in the uh, in, in in the industry? And um, yeah. Yeah, here we've got four middle-aged white blokes, you know, talking about this. So irony not lost on me, but I think we can still, you know, open this topic up. Um, and there's also, I've picked this up, there's quite a lot of industry churn. There's a lot of people moving around, you know, organisations, organisations, I think, uh, particularly Terry and Darren, you're the counterpoint, maybe to some of that, but uh, that, that appears to be a bit of an industry piece. Um, so, yeah, uh, quite a few things to unpack here, but firstly, um, again, I guess, in terms of your own company's view on some of those points, just uh, particularly the diversity point, the uh, yeah, the, 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 the recruitment challenge, just what your companies are seeing within, really, you know, what, what, how you respond to some of these issues? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think we do take a deliberate approach to um, endeavour to get a diverse workforce. We can see the benefits in that and we and we like, we, we like um, sort of going for that. So we have uh, changed in somewhat the way that we recruit people. Um, we, we're getting a lot more grads in the front door now than we used to within our group anyway. Uh, we've always had grads in our outfit, um, and that's been amazingly successful. Um, uh, so, you know, sort of gender diversity in the sort of um, low to middle grades is pretty good. It's good, like 50-50 probably. Not so good in the senior grades, so um, fewer women, for example, in, in senior grades, but the, the numbers are growing. Um, so, I mean, we do things like, it, you know, when I started, our job descriptions used to say, uh, you know, candidate must have a good degree, right? What's a good degree? Are they Britain University degrees? Like, 
So we've got rid of that because the four, if, we, if you're hiring somebody at a junior, this is for all grades, right? Grades, well, we have grading structures like one to nine, so junior grades as well, good degrees, but do we need that? Mm -hmm. Because some people can, uh, you, know, want, you know, want a career at, say, a middle grade, and that's that that seems set for their career. It's what they want to do is where they want to be. <coughs> what we don't want to do is stop people coming in the door who have that aspiration. Uh, so we're trying to sort of open it up, make it a bit more inclusive. Um, um, my daughter uh, was inspired by Lego and running a Lego robotics competition, mm -hmm. which was essentially STEM, build and design. Mm -hmm. It was like she was ten year old, and you know they were encouraged to build and engineer, you know, these crazy solutions. They went on to win the regional prize. They went on to win the English prize. They, and Lego is an unbelievable thing. Lego then took them to a global. Uh, championship, which was in America, so I, you know, luckily I went along with my daughter to the final global final in St. Louis in America, and unbelievably, this little primary school from backwater, you know, Bath uh, won the world champs, you know. and incredible, you know, they did super well. So, um, what then really, really struck me was uh, that story ended up on page 13 of the Bath Chronicle yeah. about this as a well done. Yeah. The previous team that won it was American. Obama had them in the White House the following week. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good analogy. That's yeah. a really good analogy. We've got, we've got work to do. We've got work to we've do. Got work to do. <laughs> I think because in construction, you know, in the building side, we're less diverse. So if I go onto my, my work site now, it, it, it'll be a lot less diverse in construction. But in design, those engineering um, qualifications and topics and studies are highly regarded mm. uh, and are, are, you know, are passionately followed yeah. through a lot of Europe and, and the world. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of people come and work in the UK because they like to work in the UK. So yeah, and I think you yeah. know, still the industries, um, you know, as an export, the advisory skill set, engineering, uh, project management, you know, these are hugely regarded um, mm. services. Uh, so it's an interesting kind of, uh, you know. Uh, Juxtaposition of the things, why are we you know, not more attractive, but Mark, hey. uh, No, I, I mean, listening to, you know, Terry, very similar in, in Amy, so there's lots of programs to, to sort of resolve, you, you know, to, to address this, but uh, um, I, I can't say Amy's, you know, a great role model looking at our, our senior leadership team, I have to say, yeah. um, although it is a significant and, and regular topic of conversation, and also quite open around, look, Help, like what? What, what do we need? What mm. do we need to do? It's not like that's being hidden away, um, and um, and I think we do just need to be more directive and active um, to make it. But uh, sorry, and I think the other thing is in a in a design consultancy, um, there's a lot of j just working in that sector around time and materials mm. is not necessarily a great. Environment, and I don't mean that from a, mm. um, a, a gender perspective. And I don't, I don't know whether something more broadly that we need to do mm. to change the industry to make it a great place to work. Mm. Because I think there's lots of other places that are more attractive. Mm. And very quickly, before we move to the next block, final block, is um, the knowledge management bit. You know, there's sort of just demographically, there is a huge amount of expertise that's about to leave the industry in the next ten years, and you know. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I don't know what your plans are in the next 10 years. You might be two of those you know, very, very deep experts that are, are part of that. But just very quickly, how your organisations treat the topic of knowledge management and making sure that you know, all of that knowledge just isn't you know, just literally walking out of the door. Who wants to start that? We've had several guys at this in the past. Um, and we're using technology um, to, to help us do that. We had something called Project Box. And what we were doing is we were embedding our sort of tacit knowledge of project program management into uh, in, into that into that tool. Um, but compared to other software that was available at the time, it was very clunky to use. And it was kind of it was mandated for a while. And it was like, oh, we'll do it if you use it if you like it. So it fell by the wayside. And I do think that um, you know the method uh, grid approach that we're now using is is is, is a big step forward. And it's like I'm thinking when I look at that, I think finally. You know the technology is caught up with what we actually want, um, so that's really good. And, and, and I really see that as a a great place to put a lot of our knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, and I've, and I've already successfully like use being able to tap into what's in there to inform uh, challenges that clients are currently having. So 
you know, it's already been a great thing for us, and I'm not trying to big, do a big sell. Yeah, no, no, so, yeah, no this is not geared up for a, <laughs> a, a big <bigger laughs> sell job. And, but also, you're, you're, the company's general stance around the yeah. whole thing's knowledge management, I guess, is the interesting yeah. topic. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark, Darren? I, I think we're probably further behind compared to Arab yeah. in terms of where, where, where we are. I think we're struggling with... Is know, it an agenda item, I guess, as well? Yeah, you know, is it, it's yeah. a massive, okay. massive agenda yeah, huge, item. Huge, yeah, huge, yeah. 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 But if, if anything, just from a from a compliance assurance perspective, let alone actually how do we share how do we share knowledge and how yeah. do we share all the great things that are going on. Yeah. Um, so I think it's mm -hmm. I think realistically we're still exploring technology to, yeah. to help us. It's a vulnerability assessment that we often need to do in terms of our contracting profile mm -hmm. as well. So when we take on a job, you know, the four of us here, we're all here and you're the client and we we've, we've convinced you that we know what we're talking about and we've you know, you've given us a job and then Terry says I'm off for another job on Monday I've got another job you know and then yeah. it and we can the whole project can fall over you know it just really can fall over because we don't have embedded tools and systems with a virtual Terry online that can sort of step yeah. in you know it just doesn't happen and I think building that capacity is really important for our business and we're still trying to get our heads around it uh, you know I see that on my projects and I, you know you almost go out to bed at night and say We've had a really difficult day. Please don't let Terry Anders notice him in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that. And if you're doing that, you're doing something yeah, wrong. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, we get that feeling a lot. And we, we don't have the answer yet. And maybe what you're working on might be part well, of Well, I was going to say, in some ways, we, 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 yeah, I think, again, you know, danger at saying technology is the total panacea. It never is. But I think there's some really interesting stuff that Mark's going to unpack later around natural language modelling. I mean, you know, you know, what's gone on in the world, as we know, in the last 12 months in that domain alone is very uh, exciting and um, yeah whilst not the panacea we're going to talk to how it potentially points to the future I think it also you know, Terry and Darren you might need to extend your careers by five years for it to totally catch That's up not happen, <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, move, let's move to the uh, final block then which is all things sort of digital innovation AI and obviously bringing it a bit more into the domain of you know today um, uh, yeah, I think it would be fair to say that this sector particularly has been historically very laggard and slow to adopt to you know, new tech, new innovation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it could not, that assessment again, could not be firmer about, you know, almost this recommendation number one, that technology, uh, digital you know, innovation has to be adopted to get anywhere close to meeting some of these, these challenges. The data sharing piece we talked about earlier in relation to net zero sustainability. Um, so I guess, you know, all things sort of digitalization, data, AI, et cetera. Um, Question and Mark, actually, I'm going to start with you. When we had a bit of a pre huddle, you made a really interesting point about Netflix and their kind of their culture and um, particularly in relation to sort of speed of decision making innovation. Did you want to? I thought it's a really interesting one to share. Yeah, if you've never seen it, they, they, it's, it's on the web. There's a, there's a really interesting thing about culture at Netflix and it came out about 10 years ago. But there was a, there was a graph that really struck me and it was, um, it was two. Two, two sort of straight lines, one going at a lower angle, and the lower angle was the, you know, the pace of change within an organisation, and then the pace of change external. Um, and where there's this, where, where one's going, where the external pace of change is going faster than your, your organisation's pace of change, there's, there's an area of risk. And, and in essence, most of us are probably in that risk bucket. Um, and um, uh, and, and it's just uh, go, going back to the AI point. It, it's just quite interesting when you certainly when you talk to people internally, right? Like who's who's using this stuff just out of interest? So putting aside the organisational policies around this, who's using it? And you just discover everybody internally is using it in some shape or form, mm -hmm. whether it's um, you know getting insight, whether it's oh maybe I could just rephrase this bid or this case study yeah. or this. Um, and so there's clearly this sort of hidden enthusiasm and interest and curiosity. So I think there's going to be a, you know, it's like all these things, it's going to move very, very slowly and then very, very quickly. Um, and I think we're just all going to be um, embracing it, really. I think it's, you know, it's, I think it's going to be, there's going to be more benefits than, than downsides. I think, yeah, totally. And I bounce off Mark's point to Terry and Darren, then, just. Again, you know, to leave us with a little bit of uh, sort of optimism here is, you know, what, what what innovations are you seeing in the digital AI from both in terms of internal, you know, um, in terms of organisations, but also maybe on collaborations, external client work. 
any particular examples? Of? Well, I suppose um, uh, generally, yes, we, we probably have benefit from a particular type of culture in Arab, which uh, encourages people to sort of do the things that excite them, and, that, and, and naturally leads to innovation. Um, we have things like um, uh, something called new ventures, and so if people come up with ideas for products, product design, you know, new ventures can help them actually develop that into a thing that can actually be you know, promoted mm -hmm. and sold. Um, so there's a lot of that going on, and there's always been, uh, and people have always, engineers and designers have always embraced technology to help them with their day-to-day -day work. So uh, things like parametric design and so on has been sort of quite commonplace for a while. Um, as far as whether we uh, move towards AI, I mean, I think we are told, you know, we're not instructed, we're suggestible, play with it, see what you can make of it, and, you know, yeah. I mean, we, we've developed our own large language models in-house for, for particular projects uh, to solve particular challenges that we've had at the time, uh, and that's, that's worked really well. We've got a good um, crew of um, digital experts in our digital engineering team, so uh, we often find that um, we take the role of, like, translator between the client and the systems integrator, because the, the language is the same words but mean different things, and from an engineering and a management consultancy heritage, we can actually help um, make that sort of transition to, you know, help help the understanding and yeah. make things go smooth. So yeah, yeah. No, thank you, sir. No. Um, I could certainly relate to the uh, the changes in in three D modelling and in, in in that space in design. I think where our issues have been is is that's you know, the one issue that everyone will relate to. I'm sure is is, is that it's just the hardware. You know, anyone who's ever done a presentation and has had to play a video is terrified when you press that button. <laughs> Please, let it, just let it play, you know. And I think if you scale that up, we've got, I've got integrated, we use BIM, you know, this integrated building modelling now. We've got models which are so large and so complex that we can barely run them on anything, you know. And that's the problem. One of the problems is that um, if I've got, if you're a client, and I've got, there's two, you know, I've got one chance to show you my project. I might actually give you a bit of paper. You know, we've, got, we've got to go back to the beginning and start thinking about you know, what does the technology support this innovation need to look like? You know, so that, that, that's, that, that, that's one challenge for our business, which I don't think we've 100% got up. With AI, I'm a secret user. I come out, you know, just I'm a secret <laughs> user. <laughs> so just, just user. Uh, well, in conscious time, we'll just bring it to a head, but just on AI specifically, just keen to get to your, you starting to, uh, reveal this a little bit, but what's the sort of the house position, I guess? What's the corporate stance? Is it uber, uber cautious, uh, super <coughs> excited, somewhere in the middle? How would you describe your corporate position on AI? Uh, uh, so so we're, we're, I think we're exploring every single avenue on it. Yeah. Do, do you know, I think that's, that's all over it, just we're all over yeah. it, whether it's the, the design software, whether mm. it's you know, case study writing, whether it's just internal process yeah. improvement, yeah. Um, and, and then just, yeah, just looking at all sorts of different organisations of how to use it. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think it, and it, it brings the same problem back to clients as teachers are facing when they're marking homework today, isn't it? When you think about it, you know, we've got a bid, all three clients have used AI to write the bid. You know, you're getting, you're thinking, hang on a minute, this is amazing. <laughs> but it, yeah. it may be that what's on the paper is not has got nothing to do with your capability at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and clients have to unpick that the same yeah. way as you know a person marking home has to unpick yeah. fantastic ex, you know essays on Lady Macbeth. You think, goodness, this is yeah. incredibly insightful. Yeah. You know, Johnny Briggs is yeah. the way you wrote this. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, so I, I think while, it, while it brings tremendous opportunity, it does again bring challenges. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think it's everybody catching up. At the same time, I think the, 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 my thoughts, uh, my last thought is that you know everything is changing so quickly now. Big organisations are generally a bit like super tankers, and it'll be those organisations that have a structure that allows them to be nimble, a management yeah. structure. You know, sometimes getting someone to sign a piece of paper to make a decision to do something in a big organisation yeah. can be like getting you know Ed Sheeran's autograph. <laughs> you know, it can be really, really difficult, and I think that's that frustrates people, yeah. and that's part of the sort of staff retention piece. I yeah. think if you want your staff to work for you, yeah. you know, they want they want to solve engineering problems. They don't want to spend three weeks yeah. trying to get somebody to sign a piece of paper. I think they're just the point you're you know, any technology still needs human enablement and culture, you know, kind of yeah. uh, uh, flexibility, doesn't it? But Terry, final point on that. Oh, so me mental note to self is to use AI to do to write my bids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You now have to read Terry. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, like I said, said before, uh, we're on encouraged to sort of dabble yeah. and see see how we can make something of it. Um, for our more serious digital developments, um, it's kind of business as usual, really. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. I think um, mm-hmm. well, right from the over days, it's all, like as you say, right embedded into Arab's culture to you know, explore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up there. I'm conscious of time. I'm not even gonna remotely try and uh, summarise that hugely rich, broad sweep across some strategic fronts that would take uh, too long. So I'm just going to close it by saying again, I mean, genuinely from Mefagrid, we're hugely privileged to be working with the Ilks of you know, the Arabs and the Amis and you know, genuine kind of vanguard organisations, particularly on the innovative you know, digital front. Um, some big challenges ahead, but you know, organisations like this, uh, you know, it it's, uh, gives you some sense of optimism that you know, we can pull off some of these big macro challenges. So I just want to say a huge, huge thanks again to to the three of you for taking the time on the set on this day so well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.